Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Hale. I'm an assistant professor in mechanical and aerospace engineering at the University of Florida. And uh, very pleased to be speaking here at this uh, career awardee session. Uh, I received my career award through EPCN uh, in 2020. The title of that project is A Unified Theory of Private Control Systems. This talk is called Differential Privacy and Feedback Systems. They both kind of refer to the same thing. And so what I'd like to do in this talk is go over the motivation for this work, uh, what we've accomplished so far, and where I see this going next. And so to get started, the motivation for this work is the fact that data-driven decision systems are becoming widely used. And this is due in large part to two factors. The first is new systems are popping up that are inherently data-driven, meaning from the moment they get started, they, they need data to make decisions. And second, existing systems of various kinds are becoming smart, which often means we're, we're sort of infusing data into them in new ways. An example of that class of system is the smart power grid. Here, we're putting smart meters on homes and businesses, and we're able to send granular power usage data in near real time to enable more efficient grid operation. Another example is self-driving cars. Here, we're exchanging position information either vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to infrastructure, but the basic idea is by getting information in near real time or in real time, what we're able to do is prevent congestion, uh, get people to work faster, avoid collisions, various things like that. Another class of applications is the Internet of Things. This is not really one specific use, but kind of a collection of them. And here the idea is, at a high level, by getting all these different devices, appliances, buildings, vehicles, wearable devices, by getting them connected to the internet and talking to each other, we can make various systems of this kind more efficient, we can serve users better, we can provide new services that are not possible without this data. Now in this context, and the two on the previous slide, there are a few features, common principles we can extract from the systems from these systems that kind of draw our attention. One is this, data is used to drive feedback loops. I mean, we're, we're sensing things, we're sharing information, we're using that to make decisions. The data in question is often user data in that it belongs to a user or says, says something about a user. So we're sensing user behavior. And finally, some form of that data leaves users' devices. So I'm sending this data to some decision maker or data curator and in doing that, I'm relinquishing control of this data. I don't know what that decision maker or curator is going to do with this. Now, right here is where we can start to have some problems. Users know, among other things, that their information can be leaked. And they know that because it's happened. So to focus on one country, we'll look at the US here. Since 2017 alone in the US, Social security numbers, medical records, location data, credit card numbers, and a whole bunch of other things have all been leaked. So these data curators may not be safeguarding our data very well. And that shows up in, among other places, this survey in 2018, where 79% of Americans said they would not buy any products from a company that they do not trust to protect their data. So in response to these breaches, people are saying, I don't want anything that's going to cause these problems for me. That showed up in rather dramatic fashion just last month. iOS, the, the newest iOS from Apple, the operating system on their iPhone, gave users the ability to opt in or out of information sharing. And 95% of people opted out of sharing tracking data with advertisers and various apps and services. Which means here, due in large part to privacy concerns, we see the wholesale rejection of these new technologies and services. Users have said, I'm so concerned about privacy, I don't even care what you can give me in exchange for my data, I'm not gonna let you have it. This is how I'm going to enforce privacy. I'm refusing to share data and refusing to get the benefits from it. And this comes from not only these privacy breaches, but I also don't know what this data curator is going to do with my data. And for example, with GPS locations of self-driving cars, you can learn a lot about a person by looking at where they are all the time. So those concerns and the ones on this slide lead us here. Our systems must function privately. We know that privacy breaches can cause great harm to individuals. We know that because that has happened, that harm has occurred. 
And we know a lack of privacy is a major barrier to people actually wanting to use these new technologies. We saw that in the survey, we've seen it in iOS, we've seen it in a whole bunch of other places. Privacy as a concern has gone mainstream. People know that their data can reveal a lot about them and they don't wanna let that happen. So the outcome of this is what's, what the title of the slide is, our systems must function privately. As a sort of high level desired system property, that sounds pretty good, but it forces us to confront a few questions. And these are kind of big guiding questions in the context of this project. First, what do we mean by privacy? I've said that word a few times, we need to be much more specific about what we actually want. Second, given what we want, how do we actually implement that and provide our systems with privacy? And then third, what does that do? How does that affect our systems? If we're going to change them in some way, we need to understand in quantifiable terms what that impact is. It will be prudent to start at the beginning, which means we'll start with question one here. In this body of work, what we mean by privacy is differential privacy. Uh, I'm not going to be exhaustive here. I'll just mention another approach to privacy is encryption. Often differential privacy and encryption have different goals. Uh, they've been combined in various ways to enable new data protections. My prediction is that in the future, we will use a combination of things like differential privacy and various encryption approaches. My own personal interests lead me to differential privacy. That's what this project is on and that's what I'll talk about. Now, there are three main motivations for being interested in differential privacy for control systems. The first is that it protects data through randomization. That's useful because although privacy is a, is a modern concern in control, there's more than half a century of interest in stochastic control systems, which means we have more than half a century of work we can use as our foundation here to infuse privacy in our systems and still get good performance out, even with the randomness that privacy requires. The second useful property is that it is immune to post-processing. This means if I send you a, a private piece of data X, you can compute F of X for any F you want, and that will not weaken privacy as long as you're not using some other information about me, other sensitive information that you're not supposed to have. So any computations you want, are privacy preserving. They do not make me less private. And of course, if you do know some other information about me, that does indeed weaken differential privacy. But the key here is it doesn't weaken it by much. And so this takes quite a bit more work to quantify. But the premise here is differential privacy is not defeated if you learn some other piece of information about me that I didn't intend for you to have. And we get all these properties from one basic underlying principle. So zooming out at a high level, we would like to make adjacent pieces of user data appear approximately indistinguishable. So if S1 and S2 are my pieces of data, we apply a privacy mechanism M, that's a randomized map, and we will replace S1 and S2 with samples from nearby probability distributions. That's the idea. Now we can make that concrete. We're going to go through this in one slide. This is somewhat simplified here, kind of one form of differential privacy. It gets more general than this, but this will serve our purposes in this talk. So uh, we have, going backwards, adjacent and approximately indistinguishable special keywords for us in privacy. Adjacency is defined like this. Two pieces of data, xi and xi prime, are adjacent if the distance between them is bounded above by some bi. The subscript i's here mean this belongs to one user, one user i. User i picks b i, this is my adjacency parameter. And if x i is my actual piece of data, this could be a trajectory or a function or nearly anything, everything else within distance b i of me is adjacent. So if the red circle here is my data, everything in this ball is adjacent to me, and it all must be made approximately indistinguishable from me. Approximate indistinguishability takes us to the definition of differential privacy itself. And that looks like this. So we take our xi and xi prime that are adjacent. We say a mechanism M is epsilon i delta i differentially private if M satisfies this inequality here. So to unpack this a little bit, we're saying we're going to pass xi and xi prime through my mechanism M. 
and must randomize in such a way that the distributions of the outputs obey this relationship here. So we have the scaling by e to the epsilon i, and then this additive term delta i there. Epsilon i and delta i calibrate the strength of privacy, and they have specific interpretations here. So it is a blessing and a curse that differential privacy can be distilled down to two parameters. Um, that makes it maybe simple to work with mathematically. It can make it challenging to interpret what these privacy protections mean. So to sort of summarize, intuitively, epsilon i controls the amount of information shared. Both epsilon i and delta i are specified by user i. And epsilon i basically says, this is how much information I'm willing to release. Smaller values of epsilon i make privacy stronger, and typical values range from, say, 0 0.1 up to maybe 3. Delta i is the probability that we inadvertently release too much, which is to say the probability that we inadvertently release more than what epsilon i should have allowed. Smaller delta i's also make privacy stronger. Typical values range from 0, maybe up to 0 0.05. So these are our privacy definitions, and, and this answers our first question of what do we mean by privacy? We mean this. Next, what I'm going to talk about is two research threads that we've been looking at in my group to try to privatize systems that need it. In the course of doing that, we are emphatically opposed to reinventing the wheel. We don't want to try to come up with a new control problem to privatize, and instead we'd like to return to well-tread ground, return to what people are already using, and privatize that. And the first research thread in this direction takes us to LQ control. And the setup here is N agents are going to send their outputs to an aggregator, we'll call it the cloud, and the cloud will send back inputs. So if I'm agent I, I have these discrete time LTI dynamics, and I'm going to send a private output to the cloud. This is my normal output, ci times xi, my normal output, plus this privacy noise vi. And I get epsilon i delta i differential privacy as long as vi is Gaussian, it has mean zero, and then it has variance given by this sigma i here. Uh, the lower bound on sigma i is known, it has a closed form. It's kind of complex, so I haven't written it here. But the idea is you drop in your privacy parameters, out comes a bound on your standard deviation. You implement that with your privacy noise, and then you are keeping your state trajectory differentially private. We send this to the cloud, and the cloud does two things. First, it runs a Kalman filter on everyone. This is just post-processing, so it doesn't hurt privacy. Using the output of the Kalman filter, the cloud sends every agent an optimal input. So if I'm agent I, I get this U star I, which the cloud has computed to minimize this tracking cost, quadratic tracking cost here. The cloud sends back this U star I, I plug it into my state update, and then this process continues. Send outputs, get back inputs, and we'd like to minimize this quadratic cost. We've answered two questions. What is privacy? It's differential privacy. How do we get it? We get it like this. The third question is, how does privacy impact our system? And in this context, we're fortunate because we have this quadratic cost, and so we can speak in terms of the control theoretic cost of differential privacy. And that looks like this. So what we do is we compute the cost with privacy, subtract the cost without privacy, leaves us with just the cost of privacy. And it's the sum of the traces of a few matrices. K and sigma here are solutions to discrete algebraic Riccati equations. Q and R are the matrices from our objective functional. H is a big long product of many matrices. W is where privacy noise can show up. And then sigma bar is the a posteriori error covariance of the Kalman filter, which itself we can get as a function of privacy noise. It's hard to look at this and say, yes, that looks right. It's not really the point. The point is we drop in our privacy parameters, out comes a number. What will privacy cost us? And as we can see in this plot here, the red line is with privacy, the black line is without. With privacy, our cost does go up. It does. It's not surprising. We're adding noise where it would otherwise be absent. But what we see here is over time, this increase in cost becomes pretty modest. And so what that says to us is we can implement privacy and still get reasonable performance back out. This theorem appeared in the paper in the footnote there. 
And in that paper, we have various other guidelines for calibrating privacy to give desired protections and desired performance. So we've quantified these trade-offs here and we're able to use them to make these systems do what we need. That's research thread one. Research thread two that I'll be talking about is private synthesis for MDPs. So we use the usual definition of an MDP. We have these states, we take actions from these states, and those cause us to transition randomly to new states. And those transitions are captured in these transition probabilities here, these Ps with subscripts indicating transitions between states. Now, it turns out these transition probabilities can be sensitive for a variety of reasons. For example, in an adversarial environment, a robot's transition probabilities may reveal that it knows where adversaries are located or where certain hazards are located. Or in an economical model, a firm may have transition probabilities in an MDP model that reflect how the market will react to its investments. We'd rather keep those secret. And so in these cases and others, these transition probabilities reflect our knowledge of the world in some way. What's unfortunate is that by someone else just observing us, they can make some strong inferences about these transition probabilities. Meaning, as is often the case, absent any formal privacy protections, we may be inadvertently leaking the values of these transition probabilities. So it is here in the course of privatizing P in that MDP specification that differential privacy should show up. So what we have here is some structured data. These vectors of transition probabilities have non-negative entries that add up to one. That means they lie in the unit simplex. It may be tempting to say, well, we're going to take all these points in the simplex in figure A, then add privacy noise to them, we get figure B, then project back onto the simplex, which gives us figure C. We can do that, and we did do that. And that projection is fine from a privacy perspective. Uh, it's just post-processing, so we're good in terms of privacy. But this harms accuracy a great deal. The reason is so many points end up on the boundary of the simplex that we're kind of harming the structure of the data. So very briefly, I'll just say, in targeting MDPs, our first step was to come up with a new differential privacy mechanism I won't go through every symbol here. The idea is you take your sensitive vector, pass it through a Dirichlet distribution, um, and in that Dirichlet distribution, you scale your vector by this parameter k. And what this does for us is k lets us tune differential privacy. So we've shown for the first time the Dirichlet mechanism does provide epsilon delta differential privacy to us, and both epsilon and delta depend upon k. And so th that dependence is rather complex. I haven't written it here. But for example, when k is 3, you get 2.3 comma 0 0.05 differential privacy. So that's within the typical range that we want. So that mechanism appeared in that paper. We then applied it to the case of private policy synthesis and MDPs. So once we privatize our transition probabilities, we run standard dynamic programming to get a policy. So we get that policy out, and we are led back to that question of how does privacy affect our systems? So we want differential privacy. We get it with this new Dirichlet mechanism. And here, in terms of how does it affect our system, what we have is, well, we can compute bounds on the cost of privacy in polynomial time, according to the polynomial shown here. And what we have in this plot, just to briefly go over it, is an upper bound on privacy and a lower bound. And what we find is that as privacy becomes weaker, so going from left to right on this plot, as privacy becomes weaker, our cost of privacy goes down and our bounds become more accurate. But overall, our privacy looks pretty good here. Our cost of privacy, I should say, looks pretty good here. And so what we have is we are protecting these sensitive transition probabilities. We synthesize a policy and we get good performance back out. We're currently exploring trade-offs in this work and we will have guidelines to tune them coming up. So with that, just to, with one eye on the clock, just to think about future research directions, we're currently looking at where else do we need privacy? How much performance degradation are people willing to tolerate? How else can we quantify the, uh, the guarantees of privacy and control? How else can we quantify the cost of privacy and control is another great question. And then can these other forms of privacy in controls be applied elsewhere, for example, in the learning community? These are all things that we are targeting. We, we in my group expect to present them at future ACCs. 
Uh, I'll conclude here by saying thank you. Here's my lab website, my contact info. This is my lab group. Kyle's a postdoc. The other seven are students. Uh, the top three in the circle there uh, primarily did the work here. I'll go ahead and conclude and say thank you for your time and attention.